Okay, so welcome to chapter 5 in my ethical hacking series. In this chapter, we are looking at Linux as well as automated security assessment tools. That way we can get some of that hard work done via automation. After reading, we should be able to explain at least some basic uh, Linux commands, some, some basic Linux file structure. We should be able to understand the uh, steps involved in hacking a Linux system explain how to harden a Linux system, perform Linux system assessments. So what are some Linux operating systems? Originally it was created by Linus Torvalds and it's open source and it comes in many different uh, flavors and specialized versions like Red Hat, uh, Debian, SUSE, uh, Cent, CentOS. So there are uh, Mint, Kali, numerous versions of the uh, Linux operating system. Big thing here is it's open source. That does not mean free. It just means that the code used to create it is open and it may fall under an open license, like a GNU license. All information is stored within the file system. Files are stored within a hierarchy, very similar to Windows except the directory names are separated by a forward slash as opposed to Windows, which is a backslash. User accounts are used to identify users and different permissions could be assigned depending on the appropriate uh, user or groups. The ls command, uh, ls hyphen l, is used to display uh, current permissions. Uh, the uh, change pod is used to change permissions. For our Linux permissions, it's important to understand our structure. And that should be the first uh, character should be a directory and non-directory in general. The next should be our user. And that may actually be something like a A seven, a five, and a zero. So what that means is, in our structure, we have the first option. Uh, this is for users, groups, and everyone else. And the different spots mean something. So the first spot should be read then write, then execute. A read has a value of four, a write has a two, and execute is a one. So that will equal seven. If it's five, it'll probably be something like a four and a one, so it can read and execute but without writing. And a zero, the zero is all the way. So that type of structure is very important when understanding the ls hyphen l. Common Linux directories is our root, our bin, our dev, our etc., or etc., our home, our mount, our sbin, and our user. Our bin is our user binaries. Our sbin is our system binaries. Our etc. normally is our configure. Our DEV are device files. We could also have like a pros, P-R-O-C, that could be our process information. A var, that's where we're going to do variable files. Temp, T-M-P. A user is going to be our user programs. Slash home will be our home directory. A lib will be our system library. Our... Uh, MNT will be our mount directory. So I can think I've covered all of them. If we open a terminal to execute a Linux command, it's very similar to a Windows command prompt with the uh, pound means that you're logged in as root and the root account is similar to our main administrator. Next basic commands could be like cat, read, cd change directory uh, chmod that's going to be a uh, change permissions cp 
history is our history. If config is very similar to our IP config, kill is a terminate, ls will be the list files, man is manual, mv is the move or rename files, pwd is present working directory, ps is could be a uh, process, ps several different meanings, rm should be remove, rm hyphen r should be recursive, but again, we have to be very specific because different versions of Linux may have very similar commands that do different functions. So users and groups are assigned a user ID and a group ID respectively. Information about our user groups. Our users and groups are stored in our passwd file. That's not where passwords are stored. That's where membership is stored. The root account always has a UID of zero and a group ID of zero. If we want to add a new user via command line, we could actually do user add. If we want to perform action as a different user than the one we're logged in as, we could do su su and that user. Passwords are required for user accounts, but a blank password can be used by default. Password encryption can be selected during our installation. Normally, MD5 is our default encryption, and it's used by most versions. However, DES can also be used, though DES is limited in passwords uh, to eight characters. ETC Shadow file is used for additional password security. Only root user has access to this file and we could actually look at more information for our shadow. Passwords in Linux use a salt, and that's one of 4,096 values that help further scramble the password when it's being encrypted. So Linux does take encryption and password security very serious. Passwords are one of the weakest forms of authentication, so there are multiple authentication mechanisms that could be a used in conjunction like biometrics or token, or maybe a PAM, a pluggable authentication module. Some of the tools that you use to crack passwords, John the Ripper, which we've used in a lab before. We could also look at compressing, installing, and compiling Linux. For example, one of the most commonly used compression formats in Linux are uh, TARS. And we can collect several files and we can uh, join it into one, like a zip or a rar in Windows. Gzip is uh, used for our compression. To compile the program in Linux, the following three commands could be used. Uh, period, forward slash configure, make, make install. Uh, those are for compiling. That's not limited, but I mean, those are the, the bare, uh, bare bone ones. So for the following, uh, basic ethical hacking methodology, which we've already discussed in almost every chapter, and that's our reconnaissance, scanning enumeration, gaining access, escalation of privileges, so we can get better privileges, maintain access, and then cover, and place backdoors so we can get in later. Again, that's been very straightforward in almost every chapter. Reconnaissance could be active and passive, that can include things like scanning. Our scanning is going to be looking for specific ports that are common to Linux. Enumeration could be things like uh, enter grabbing or fingering. Uh, could also be uh, some type of SMTP uh, verifying. That way we could uh, figure out what our hosts are. Gaining access, again, remote attacks. Being able to exploit a processor program or port or a vulnerability in the system, or even the user with the uh, purpose of getting base access. That way we can then later uh, do a privilege escalation so we get better privileges. Maintaining an access, uh, or maintaining access and then covering your tracks could be things like uh, rootkits that will help hide our presence. And we could look at different uh, categories things like bootloaders and 
application level and things like that that our rootkits could be uh, injected into. Traditional rootkits are replaced by binaries such as ipconfig and netstat with a Trojan version. That way, you're still running the program, but you don't realize that it's uh, infected. Infecting uh, Internet Explorer is also very common. Rootkits uh, target loadable kernel modules, things that are built into Windows. That way, they're auto-load. Examples could be like Flea and Torm and Adorm. Uh, detection could be uh, Chuck Rootkit or McAfee or Trend Micro Rootkits. The rootkit busters are always going to depend on the rootkit themselves, but there are several that are out there. Hardening could be things like uh, placing firewalls and filters, uh, lessening the attack surface by removing unneeded uh, programs and services, uh, understanding the principle of least privilege, following industry best practices for hardening, you can also look at hardening tools like a ch uh, root or TCP wrapper or tripwire. Moving on to our automated assessment tools. One of the biggest things that people don't realize is we're not looking for the uh, assessments in, by ourselves. We're going to be looking at tools that can help automate this process so we don't have to spend time doing it. And that could be like system scanners or application scanners. That way we can see what's there, what we could exploit possible. Source code scanners are a big one. Uh, RATS, this is one version of RATS. RATS could also be a remote access Trojan. But source code scanners are used to scan source code to see if there's a vulnerability in there. Application scanners are programs like InStealth and Neat2 or App Detective, but that way they can help find what applications are there. That way we can figure out if one of them has a known vulnerability. System level scanning, same thing. We're scanning the system so we can figure out maybe what version or what build so that we can run things like Land Guard or uh, Retina or Net Recon. That way we could see if we could get an exploit for that specific system or a hole in the operating system. Automated exploit tools could be like things like Metaspoil or Canvas or Core Impact, things that are gonna help combine our report of, our scanning, our assessment, our reporting, all into one. And that's actually it for our chapter. The, again, this was just a very, very uh, high level, basic, chapter on Linux. For more information, maybe look at my Linux uh, Essentials videos, because that gives you a nice brief overview of Linux in general. Again, thank you.